I will say good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining. I can see a lot of uh, the, the, the familiar faces. And whenever I go into a Depeche Mode Global uh, chat, uh, there are always those same faces that I see every time. And it's good to see some uh, new people that have joined tonight. Thanks very much. And it's being streamed to Facebook Live. Is that right, Rob? Yes, that's correct. That's right. Okay. Okay, guys. So um, I'm going to be as quick as I can. Um, the whole idea here really is to, we are, as I say, over the past, uh, the previous chat on my channel last week, we are really promoting Gareth's Electrogenetic album. Um, Electrogenetic was released digitally and on limited disc cassette on the 18th of September this year. Uh, I know a lot of you have heard it and um, a lot of you have actually, you know, bought it on um, Bandcamp. So thank you very much. Um, and Obviously, you guys know how this started. Um, I came and interviewed Gareth along with Simon, my wingman over there, and Lloyd. And uh, we just started talking about this because during the interview, um, first of all, my mind was absolutely blown by the record. And I'm sure a lot of people here will, will agree that have heard it. Um, and then talking about the record, I was surprised to hear that Gareth was not going to release it on vinyl. Um, and that, I thought, was very strange because obviously you're a tape and a vinyl man. Um, and then, of course, looking at the running time of the record, it was 39 minutes. So I thought, this is so clearly set up for vinyl. So anyway, Gareth said, well, there was no plan to release it on vinyl. Um, so we then decided, to cut long story short, that we would start this little uh, crowdfunding campaign. And the whole idea behind this is not to really force this upon you, because, I mean, this is a great record. Um, and if you choose not to listen to it on vinyl, you know, uh, just the fact that you you know, get it on Bandcamp or whatever is great. But I just think um, because of because the people in this group and my group are fundamentally such music lovers, to get Gareth's record on vinyl would be a dream come true for Gareth. And um, so that is why we started the Indiegogo campaign. The Indiegogo campaign is really just to, it's really for you to pre-order the vinyl. Um, and, and, and it's for us to gauge interest. It, and and that, uh, obviously we're not offended if, if we don't reach our threshold. Correct. Uh, I, I'm sure I think we might. Yeah. But if we don't, you know, that's fine. It's really just an experiment to gauge interest, to see if there's interest for the vinyl. If there is wonderful, we'd love to make it. Vaughan's yeah. been super helpful yeah. with uh, his uh, Agro Monkey records. <laughs> He's taking care of the whole record company side of things. So that's great. He's a friendly record company. <laughs> Sorry, with an agro monkey now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so really, thanks for that, Gareth. I mean, the whole idea here is not to force anything. It really just is saying, look, guys, this, this is what we want to do. Here's the link. Um, if you guys want it, we'll press it. If there's not enough interest, we won't. So that's really all there is to it. And with that out the way, I think uh, uh, Rob's going to start the tape or over to you, Rob. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gareth Jones and welcome to my art lab studio. Earlier this year, after decades of helping other people make awesome records, I released my own debut solo album called Electrogenetic. The Electrogenetic album is already available on Bandcamp uh, with Calm and Collect, uh, my first record label. Uh, it's a digital download and a limited cassette. Uh, we've also done a small CD release on Wormhole. But of course, uh, my dream and uh, Vaughan George's dream, who I'm working with on this project, is to do a vinyl release. Hoping that we're going to get interest from the community to help crowdfund this ambitious project, we're already laying plans for how it might turn out. One of the first things as an audio geek that I'm concerned about is audio quality. The vinyl will be cut by Alex Wharton, 
at Abbey Road. I've been talking to Vaughan about the vinyl package and we've decided to do a simple sleeve with obviously top quality vinyl, 180 gram black vinyl in the package. And today, uh, Vaughan had a wonderful idea which I'm so pleased about, which is that if the community decide to help us crowdfund this project, we're going to credit everyone's name on a, a 12 inch square inset inside the sleeve so that I can give a thank you to all the people who have helped sponsor the project. So thank you very much for your time and kind attention. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity for me this to be able to make a vinyl and uh, most importantly I hope you enjoy listening to the record that is uh, very important to me and was a joy and a delight and a wonderful struggle to make. Thank you again for listening and thanks for your potential support. Cheers. Love. <clears throat> love it. I love it. Love it. As, as Von George me mentioned last <laughs> week, we had a, an event with, with Gareth on his channel. And I had been holding out because I knew we were, that there was the possibility of a vinyl. So I had been holding out on listening to, to Gareth's album because I wanted to hear it on vinyl. For, but I got so excited after last week's <laughs> event that I had to listen to the album and I loved it. And uh, I want to play you all my favorite track from the album if you guys are cool with listening to that right now um so let me go ahead and put that on for you <clears throat> you see my screen okay we can yeah okay so you can also go here this is on Bandcamp. you could listen to the album you can uh get the cassette or the digital download but I highly recommend the vinyl. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is my favorite track from the album. Is it Alone Together? Yeah. Yes, Alone Together is the title. I'm going to cry now. <laughs>
So that's a that's a great track. That's the end of the album right there. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy that. It's a really great song, Yay! Garrett. So so beautiful. Oh thank yeah. You. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. That was beautiful. Wow, loved it. Yeah. So so Gareth, to start us off, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, after four decades in the music business, what um what drove you to finally put out a release now and maybe even talk about a few of the songs like particularly like Alone Together or any of your other favorite tracks? Whoa, uh, big, big, uh, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have, in the last, I suppose, five years or something, I've enjoyed a wonderful uh, collaboration with my friend uh, Nick Hook. I, I chatted, I apologize for if I said this, if some of you guys have heard this last week, but um, I have a project called Spiritual Friendship with Nick Hook that. Uh, is an, based on the no judgment and just getting showing up getting the work done and uh, finishing the projects which i think is really important for artistic endeavor to to j just to be able to get stuff finished so that was a great breakthrough that nick and i made with spiritual friendship and i have another wonderful have a number of other projects that i've done collaboratively <clears throat> one with my friend chris bono on uh, our silent canvas records uh, which is, uh, we've got an, an, a new album coming out next year. And having kind of broken my, broken the ice, uh, doing original, completing original music, because like many people, I had loads of sketches on my computer and that never got finished. But having kind of broken through this barrier of being able to finish, um, I think, uh, let me see now, it's 2019. Um, at the end of 2018, as I've mentioned, uh, my mother-in-law and my mother both died um, and they were both very elderly. Uh, and so they had long and full lives. So it was just part of the big circle of life and death, right? Um, but it, it kind of obviously touched me. And, uh, and a couple of the songs were written actually in the, my mother-in-law's basement uh, when in in uh, Detroit outside Detroit in Taylor Michigan uh, when we, I went with my wife to help clear the house um, and this so so 2000 so this happened at the end of 2018 2019 I thought I really need to do a solo project um, just uh, to, to for, for I don't know why I felt I needed to do it for 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 fun, really, because it seemed like an impossible thing to do. I suppose I thought, oh, I really I need to do this. I knew it could be done. Many people have done solo projects, but um, I felt it was important, and I felt the time. And I'm not, you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm over. I'm 65 now. So uh, 2019, I was also 60. I had my 65th birthday. I'm 66 now. So. It kind of felt like a, uh, you know, a, a, um, a water, uh, a, a, what's it called, a, a watershed moment. I thought, well, if not now, when kind of thing. So, and I made a personal commitment to myself. I told a couple of close friends that I had this in mind, which kind of made me, forced me really to actually complete it. Because uh, as, a, as I said, uh, I would have felt such an idiot if I hadn't completed it, uh, having mentioned to my wife and another couple of close friends and colleagues that I was planning it. Um, I mean, people weren't checking in every week to see what I was doing or anything. And it, of course I did lots of other things in that year as well. I was just, I thought by December, 2019, I need to have this somebody of work finished. So that was it. I wrote that song that you uh, just paid for us, Rob. I actually wrote here in this room, right by where I'm sitting now. Um, and the piano is, um, and it's on the electrogenetic.com website, a little picture of it and some details. But the piano is a multi-sample I made about seven or eight years ago. Of my my mum's old grand piano that I used to play when I was a kid uh, in her in the front room in the house. Wow. So um, wow. it was massively out of tune, uh, but I sampled every note. Uh, and then a few years later, I just had the the, the file sitting there. I sampled it kind of loud, quiet, and medium, and and with the sustain pedal on as well. And a few years later, I thought I just sat down one afternoon, I just tuned every note, and made a, like a very personal. 
it's the, the piano you know i played that piano 50 years ago when i was a kid like i said so so that that speaks to me that that became my piano sound that is my piano sound now that's my piano so um and somehow this combination of that piano from decades ago and one afternoon just playing around with it's the only piece i wrote at the piano actually all the other pieces are composed with a modular and and uh, lots of different um we can talk a bit more about modular later if anyone wants to but but this piece i actually wrote in a conventional way i wrote the two little chord sequences um for the a and the b part and and the, it's a 13 8 rhythm as well so um that that all just kind of emerged i don't know how these things work i was just like noodling i suppose and i thought oh there's something here i like this and i just like tracked it and so and then later the later i i was looking for words and i used uh, some original words on the album and uh, the first piece on the album uh, opens with the opening of the book of genesis as well so i didn't want to use other people's words across the album and i had this little idea that i'd been working on in my journal so i i just spoke the words i'm not quite I'm not I'm not the world's best singer, so a lot of the word, a lot of the vocals on on my record are spoken words. So I've probably said enough. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I've probably said enough for a bit. I'll open the floor for other people. <laughs> no, that, that, that was that, that was great and very lovely. Touching with the piano, the whole thing. That's amazing. And <clears> um, <throat> just just to reiterate, before we open the floor to questions for anything about his career or or about the electrogenetic, whatever, but. Before we get to that, I just want to reiterate, I shared the vinyl link in the chat. I think it would be absolutely amazing if we can make this happen for Gareth. And not only does it happen for him, we get a great album. And not only do we get the, he's actually going to include everyone who contributes in the, on a 12 inch inside the record, like an insert. And, and I, I believe these are all going to be autographed by you as well. Right, Gareth? Yeah, we're yeah we're gonna we're gonna sign the first run for sure. We're gonna we're gonna sign them all. I'm gonna sign them all. Yeah, and I and we're gonna number them as well. So you know it's gonna be so just so to make it a it's a limited edition, isn't it? It's a special thing. Yeah, this but is it's Vaughan's good. idea. I love Vaughan's idea of of uh, having everyone's name on an insert. It's like you know uh, my my dad when he retired. He was a teacher when he retired. They they got a little art center together in the town. And they allowed you, they encouraged people to sponsor the art center, you know, because it's a charity. Then you could make a donation and get your name on a seat. So, so, so I did that actually. I got my name on a seat in this little art center. But it's a kind of traditional thing. You see it in an art gallery as well. It's a kind of thanks to the sponsors. And, and when Vaughan came up with it, I said, how perfect that would be if we can just have a nice thanks to the sponsors inside the actual product. So, anyway, it's a small thing, but it's important to us. Yeah. Absolutely amazing, definitely. Um, so, as we're going to open things up, I, I'm going to I'm going to start off with a question actually, and then I'll, I'm going to watch for you guys. But this is going to take it completely opposite from where we were. But of course, it's going to be a little Depeche Mode related. So, on on their remastered DVDs, they had a lot of different interviews with with you, Gareth, and um, one one in one particular instance, you mentioned during some great reward that master and servant was kind of like you guys putting into pop the whole nightlife scene from Berlin. So it sounds like you kind of went clubbing with the boys in Berlin. Do you have any interesting stories or any like fun stories to share from that time? Well, yes. Um, there's two <laughs> little things that come to I mind. Mean, basically we didn't, I didn't, we didn't go out clubbing that much. We just worked all the time, but we did always used to go out for a beer after work because, uh, but, uh, it was after coming from Britain back in the 80s where all the bars closed at 11 o'clock at night in Berlin. It was like the sun bars were open all night, you know. So that was a wonderful recipe to drink too much beer after work for us. But but so we often we used to go out often and have a few beers and, or a couple of beers and uh, a, a, a snack. I, we discovered a, a, bait, a baked camembert, which is like a, a, sm a camembert cheese baked in the oven with toast that we loved. Not the most healthy snack. It's the kind of thing I can have like one a year now. But at the time, we enjoyed that. And the other great story about it that pops to mind now anyway, is I do remember that when we, there was this kind of, this is long before the techno scene happened in Berlin, long before Trezor and 
so many other cool clubs opened. Um, but there was a like a club called Jungle, Jungle, um, that was had existed maybe even in the late seventies. That seemed to be like a club, you know, where people went. So we used to go there, and we used to joke because we used to like stand together on our own and watch, like watching all these exotic um, Berlin nightlife creatures do their thing. And we always said that we were stuck in uncool corner. <laughs> that, was, that was us, the little boys from London in the corner of this club at Jungle. You know, so we all thought that was quite funny. That's how we felt, for sure, because it took us a while to get up to speed with the Berlin scene. That's great. So everybody, if you want to put your virtual hands up, if you have a question, and, and I'll, get, I'll try to get to you in, in order if I can. Uh, why don't we start with Mark from the UK? Hi everyone. Hi Gareth. Hi Vaughan. Um, Hi Mark. Just to uh, just to say, I've bought the vinyl to well paid for the vinyl today, but I put my wrong email address in, so God knows what's going to happen. But we'll see what happens after that. But one question for you, Gareth: What was the hardest DM album to produ pr produce for you? Well, I was a co-producer, of course. Always, I just that needs to be underlined. I think because. Often, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to take credit where it's not due. So I was a co-producer and the hardest, the hardest one. No, they were all complete. You know, I, I say I mentioned last week, Mark, um, that, that, you know, it was a pretty privileged situation because we felt we were doing experimental electro pop. And we were getting funded somehow by the record company and by the band's success to get time with awesome synthesizers in fantastic studios, basically working on great songs, mucking about and, and trying to explore and, and learn and develop new sounds and new tech. So that it was all, they were all like wonderful voyages of discovery. Plus I got paid. So, <laughs> you know, that is incredible. I always think like on, on jobs, I think, it's really you know uh, you either need to be working with super nice people or you know i've always said you need two of these three things super nice people learning a very great deal and getting paid and if you can get two of those uh, on a freelance job i think that's you're already like way ahead and of course working with uh, daniel and uh, depeche uh, it was all three of those things because there was an incredible team of people uh, we got i got paid and we were privileged to be able to learn so much together and apart and alone. <laughs> so, uh, so probably, probably on that, Gareth, was did one click, well, I was trying to probably ask you, did one click kind of quicker than the others? Did one yeah. really- Yeah, well, the, really... the first one clicked because we were all fresh. Construction yeah. time was yeah. just like, we just went for it. No yeah. one, we weren't even really considered. I mean, I, I, I certainly wasn't experienced enough to be considering anything. It wasn't like we were, trying to outdo anything or beat the previous out you know the previous album uh hadn't done that well a broken frame it was a bit it was a, it didn't i don't think it had done as well as the first album so so the band were only going one direction in their mind which was forwards and up you know so there was a wonderful positive energy from that new whole new team of people that clicked and black celebration was i wouldn't say it was the most difficult but it was the most intense because we did this crazy thing inspired by Werner, Werner Herzog, that Daniel's idea of like living the album, where we said every day in the studio, no days off until we finished the album. So we had to, even the day when we flew between Berlin and London, when we swapped over venues, because the Berlin trilogy was all, all the first half of each of those albums was made in London. But then even that day, we went straight in the studio when we got off the air, air plane wherever it was called we came out of the airport went straight to the studio but so that was madly intense but 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 i don't know and maybe it was more difficult or not. i don't know i don't think i think i felt we were all growing so much that it didn't seem like difficult see it was more like exhausted you know because we were like workaholics all of us so and 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 uh, young as well so sleep didn't seem to be that important so of course we got tired we got exhausted but we were very uplifted by the, uh, the 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 nature of the nature of the songs, I suppose, and what we were trying to do, make these amazing what turned out to be amazing albums, you know. Um, but so 
Uh, difficult, I don't, yeah, challenging, sure. Difficult, I can't, not really, Mark, no. Excellent, no, that's a good answer. Cheers, thanks very much. And I love your new stuff as well. Really enjoyed listening to it. So uh, looking forward thank to the so final, mate. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks for your support, brother. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks. So, so along those lines, Gareth, I, I think, were, were you guys using a Synclavier sampler? Is that what, what it was that, um, was it, was it like, it was new technology, very expensive, or, or was it a Fairlight? I'm not sure what the difference when those older sampling things, but um, was it exciting it just, or frustrating to use that that kind of? Well, it was, it, 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 sorry, Rob, it wasn't just the Synclavier. Daniel had did buy a Synclavier at some stage, but but there was a lot, you know, we were making a whole transition in technology uh, uh, where digital t technology, digital sampling technology was becoming available generally, emulator, Martin had a, 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 some kind of emulator keyboard thing. I had a bunch of different samplers. I had a studio sampler called, a legendary studio sampler called an AMS. We probably had other samplers. We were working with, first of all, on 24 track tape, syncing, getting everything synced up to tape. This was a big learning curve for us. The new, the, the Synclavier allowed was a, basically a high quality poly, uh, not a high, a high quality sampler initially one sound at a time later daniel bought a huge upgrade that for black celebration that allowed us to play more than one sound at a time um sync was a big challenge um we were learning how to i mean personally speaking i was just learning how to make records rob uh, you know and I, and I had i felt i was in a great forum for that because i was working it, I mean, it wasn't so much that I was consciously aware of it at the time. We were just kind of mates. I, was, I watched Depeche get bigger and bigger. But, you know, it turned out I was working with the great songwriters uh, and, and a, 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 a great band who had loads of energy and ambition and a great work ethic. You've got to work hard. And, um, and Daniel, of course, as a, a Svengali producer, record company, visionary kind of guy. So just being around this being a part of this incredible creative vortex was a huge, watching how everyone tried to hone songs, the importance of middle parts, making choruses work, adding extra riffs to lift the song in the right place, or, or understanding how songs were constructed. I think that's one of the big things I learned in those days. Of course, there was a wealth of technical challenges as well, especially when we went to 48 tracks, syncing to analog machines. Sync. Sync. Oh, that? some stage. oh, that's an echo of me. Uh, I'll stop for a minute. Yeah, I mean, some, someone uh, had their audio on. So it, by the way, yeah, if you're not speaking, be sure to mute your, uh, your microphone. And then when you do speak, if, if you could uh, unmute it. And yes, I love that answer. And for those of you who, have, who weren't here earlier, Gareth picked our drinking word of the day is love. So love uh, cheers to that cheers to that I'll drink all you need is love 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 is all you need so we're gonna go on to depeche mode seven inch heaven you have a question right hello gareth hello vaughn um uh, a bit going further on that on uh the early days in berlin uh you worked with einstein in the night and for a while and uh, I've got this question be coming from that point when you uh, started collaborating with the Pesh um, and they came from a rather poppy kind of uh, music. How, were, how did they react to that way of working? Uh, were there any preconceptions about it or were they like an open book? Who? Depeche? Pesh. Yeah. Well, well, what happened was See, I was a bit, I, I was a very enthusiastic and excited about synth. I'd done some work with synthesizers before. And I was very excited to be able to take this further. Synthesizer has been an important part of my life anyway, it was even before I met Daniel and Depeche mm -hmm. um, and uh, changed my life in the 60s, really, when I heard some, some synthesizer. And so uh so i was in i, I wasn't i was in th enthusiastic and i had lots of ideas and uh, luckily i think what happened was our aesthetics overlapped 
So it wasn't, so basically I would do some weird shit, like maybe put a synth through an amp or something and mic up a room. And I mean, we've, I've talked about this a lot, but, but, and it seemed to re and because we were trying to do what we thought was all new stuff, it was all very exciting. As an artist, it's always exciting, isn't it? When we discover a new door to walk through or we push through a boundary and we go somewhere where we haven't before, you know, if we've been painting in yellow and blue forever and someone says, well, what about red? You know, it, like it's very super exciting. So, so I, I don't think I was considered in a, in a way because I was much younger. I, I wasn't really considered. Um, I just like did loads of things and a lot of, and of course I was, uh, I started off as an engineer on construction time again. And obviously my job is to, uh, the engineer's job is to help the band and the producer realize their vision and bring, you know, interesting sonic stuff to the table. And I was definitely up for trying to do, bring lots of interesting sonic stuff. You know, it's, it's all a dialogue when you're working with a, uh, where, where all the music is programmed on a computer everyone's everyone's involved in every overdub uh it's not like recording a guitar where the guitarist is so responsible for the tone of the guitar if you're recording a riff on a mm -hmm. you know program by a computer so so i don't know how much new i bought to what because I, I wasn't there on the first two depeche mode albums they work with super talented people on the first two albums with Daniel as well. So I'm sure they did lots of experimentation on those albums and really me just getting on board. They were just continuing to grow and experiment and in a very open way. It always felt like a very open, I think it's important in creative artistic relationships that we, if we work together in a group, if anyone has an idea, we try the idea. This is a big thing. You, we don't shut each other down. It always fails, I feel, when people shut each other down. And I've seen it with some younger bands uh, uh, you know, so, uh, someone wants to try an idea and two other people go, no. And then you just think, well, why is that? Why is that even a, why are they even working together? You know, okay. if, if even, even in putting this, um, this Indiegogo thing together, if Vaughan has an idea, we try it yeah. or, or we talk about it. Then if I have an idea, Vaughan listens to me. And it's same with making music, making any collaborative, making theater, making, that's why we work together to, to try each other's ideas out. So they were very, but as true artists, they were very open to any ideas I had. And of course I was extremely open to any ideas they had. Okay, that, thank you. Is that any good? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> I wish you all the luck with, uh, with the record. I'll be supporting you as well. I think it's thank a you, great brother. idea. And um, I'll catch up with everything you do. All right. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And thank take you. care, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank Same you, to you. Love that answer, by the way. Beautiful. So, so our next. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to answer, like, well, just because of what he said. I, I, don't, I don't have a question, but that was an absolutely beautiful answer in regards to collaborating and listening to, you know, the people that you're working with to come together and, and listen. That, that that was just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's you're yeah, welcome. It's so important, I feel, and I I do try to underline it more and more because because also you know when, when you're making music. It's way more fun to try people's musical ideas than to shut each other down. It's way more fun to say, oh, let's just try that. And then in half an hour, you've tried it. It's so much more fun than having a two hour discussion about whether it's worth trying or not. You know, <laughs> I met a wonderful engineer in Texas once who said, I'm really sick of sitting in a small room listening to people arguing, <laughs> you know, because what we're supposed to do as musicians is make music. And then you listen back to it. And you get it's, if you try three different things, you listen back. Everyone agrees almost always once you listen back, which is the most powerful idea, because yeah. the language of music speaks to your soul and your heart. So, anyway, sorry, I'll take another question if anyone's got one. We're we're gonna go move on to uh, one of our youngest fans who wasn't even born when you worked on these albums, but he's a great fan and a good guy. We're gonna ask Willie to go ahead and ask a question. Hey there. So it is a absolute pleasure to meet you, Gareth, and once again, Vaughn. Uh, it is Hi, Willie. Hi, Willie. We lost him. Your, your, audio, off, your audio dropped out, Willie. Hello? Yeah, you're back. 
Okay, cool. All right, so I'll start over. So Gareth, it is a pleasure to meet you and Vaughn. Good to see you again. Um, I have a very generalized question. So what were, so like, you know, what was Depeche Mode like to work with just as people? How were they as people? I've always been curious. I'm gonna, I, I almost wanna make a terrible pun, a song, song title pun. People love but, but I'm not yeah. going yeah. <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not going to though. Um, I'll but, do it for you. But, uh, Just people. They, well, simply, Willie, they were awesome. Uh, but they were, uh, uh, they were already, I mean, I don't know, I worked with them over a, a bunch of years in the mid eighties. So I saw them do some huge gigs. So they, they were already a big band when I started working with them, but they were, they just, but they were super nice, very, uh, very uh, uh, um, witty, you know, like a lot of smart people or creative people, just very funny. They're really good at uh, laughing their way out of corners, uh, which is a, a great thing that I found that helps in these crucible, intense working environments. You know, I've met another guy in, in Belgium who's a brilliant producer called Phil Delia who was really good at diffusing bad tension by just making a joke or having a laugh, yeah. an appropriate yeah. joke, and by just having a laugh. So, so we had a lot of laughs and they were also very kind of, I would say down to earth. Yeah. Of course, when, you know, when, when, when they went out and played some massive stadium, it's like, you know, uh, I don't like, I mean, they were like superstars, if you like, but in, in the, in the studio when uh, uh, um, everyone was very down to earth, it, it, and and very personable very approachable uh very you know like we were i think they were in their kind of early 20s when we started working together so they were quite 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 young and so every, you know you get, like just like normal we get people get frustrated people get frustrated sometimes when there's a lot of work to do people get tired people get edgy you know, people get a bit argy bargy. Whoa, what do you mean? This kind of thing. So, but in general, I only have good memories of it. Like really, um, uh, uh, like a down to earth, no bullshit kind of creative relationship. I think the humor is a big part of that. I, I think the fact that we could laugh at ourselves, we didn't, we didn't take ourselves too seriously, although we took the work seriously. Yeah. So Willie, if you get a chance, I compiled a video from some of the DVD remasters that I posted a link to in uh, Global, and you can see like in the studio, Gareth is carrying around Martin Gore, Dave Bond's <laughs> wrapping uh, Gareth's tie around him, so you can see them goofing off in the studio actually during the time. So that's awesome. You should check it out. <laughs> I will. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate it, and I will be supporting the vinyl record. So. Thank you, Willie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Willie. Yeah. I saw Simon with his hand up over there. So I'm going to go ahead and ask, let Simon ask a question. A wingman, Simon, where is he? You got to unmute yourself. I've got to unmute myself. Hello. Yes. Audio. Hi, Simon. Uh, just, just a quick nerdy question for Gareth, I'm afraid. Uh, I noticed that you used a fugue machine or a fugue machine was credited in the album on, I think, the last or second to last track. Very astute, just, Simon. Yeah, well, I'm not called a nerd for nothing. <laughs> oh, there you go. Nerds for nothing. That's a good. We could use that. Nerds for love, nothing. That's a good one. I'm gonna write love nerds. <laughs> nerds for nothing. Yeah. yeah. Nerds for nothing. That was a. I oh, love that. Yeah. Thanks. Anyway. Yeah. And. I'm um, just curious if you used it like just directly on the iPad or if you linked it up to the modular or so because that's something I'm looking to do. No, I think it's both. I think I. Th ah. I, know, I might have to have a look in the session. I definitely fed the MIDI out though into the modular, and I, but I might have used a, 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 a layered. I might have had you know part of the sound coming off something in the iPad, but yeah. but the MIDI. You know, I was just look. I've, it's so p cool. I'm just. Uh, I've got built a little modular setup in in Studio G. I call it G for Gareth at home. Studio B at home. Um, and I, there's, I've got three little sequences in there, actually. I've got the zero control, the Korg, obviously the SQ-1, and an Arturia thing. And they're all, like, super fun, obviously. Uh, but but I'm, the, I'm so excited by all the sequences on the iPad because, they're, you know, they're so affordable. 
and so powerful. Yeah, amazing stuff. On there, yeah, yeah, some of them don't sing. I mean, I don't know. I'm not up to speed on this. I, I have to check it out every time. I remember having a few sync issues, but I've had sync issues my whole life, Simon. So I'm <laughs> used to the challenges with sync as part of it. But but um, even in Logic, they got the they got the, the they got a nice step sequencer. I, I'm a big Logic fan. And the uh, yeah, yeah. you can control the step sequence from the iPad now, and that's super fun. I had a little go through that the other day, but I am a so so yeah. I've got a MIDI interface. I suppose iRig. I think I've I've got a bunch of IK multimedia interfaces that all do MIDI. One of them's pure MIDI, and the other two do audio and MIDI. So I find that a really convenient way of like just yeah, yeah. getting audio and MIDI in and out of the iPad. Just a, a dedicated hardware box. So it's the, is it the iConnect boxes that do the audio and MIDI, isn't it? Yeah, the iConnect, they're a bit more fancy. I've got some yeah, iConnect got boxes, but I mean, yeah, okay, you, yeah, that works too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. No, but anyway, nothing, the, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the Fugue machine is definitely playing out to the modular as well. I think there's a duet going on between two kind of sounds off the Fugue machine. I remember the vibe when I made it in here, where, it, where the, I just thought, that's amazing. It's like bouncing to, you know, playing off each other. Partly modular and partly in the box, in the iPad. I should say, in the pad. I should say. The pad. <laughs> Sorry, I just got to write down nerds for nothing. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a little housekeeping thing. There, there are multiple pages because there are a lot of people on here. So, if for some reason I don't see your hand, um, you could direct message me. But also, you know, depending on devices, because I know everyone's logging in from different devices. If you look on some, some of your devices, you'll see people have their little blue hand. So I'm putting together a queue of questions. So um, if, if for some reason I don't see you, make sure you message me in the chat. So next we're going to Mike in Seattle. Hello again. Hi, Mike. Hello, Mark. Hey, Hi, Mike. Um, Gareth, how much, I, I'm, I don't want to bore everybody again with, too much technical nerdy stuff but how much of the the like what you sampled to make particular sounds do you recall like for example the the lead sound in in but not tonight um that sort of thing yeah i know there's a whole bunch of layers and stuff going on that's that's one that i've been trying to kind of quote unquote recreate for a for a long time, uh, just because I, I find it fascinating to, uh, you know, deconstruct and reconstruct on my own, trying to figure out what you guys did. And I, I mean, when you're, when you're sampling, you know, unique stuff where you're just walking down the street, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to replicate that. Um, but anyway, that, that was, that was my question. Um, you know, and I, yeah, I'll leave yeah it well to, to I think it's like uh, I would say that it's like that expression about the 60s that anyone who remembers the 60s wasn't really there and I'm a bit like that with the 80s men to be honest I have no <laughs> idea how we yeah. made some of that stuff and I know and I even so much so that when they did the the surround the 5.1 remixes do you remember mute did some yeah 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 I have them all 10 years ago or something mm -hmm. Kevin at mute did some wonderful surround sound remixes of and so obviously we got the, the engineers and the producers who worked on it got invited in to like have a chat with Kevin when he got everything working up and help out on a couple of things mm. if, if necessary. And it was so exciting and interesting, like, interesting for me to hear the multi-track right. that I'd made right. myself like, you know, tw 15 years before. Right. So, right. so it, it's really, the, I would, I think documentation is a really great thing, but I don't, I didn't do it. Mm. And I still don't do enough of it. You know, what I should have done is had a note, what I should have done, what would have been interesting <laughs> would yeah. be to have a session logbook, you know, right. like, like they've been published, like Jeff Emery with the Beatles published, you yeah. know, then you say, okay, and then I could tell you, I could go, but not tonight. Yes. On the 17th of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, but it was such a, a vortex, a, a crucible of creativity, uh, uh, you know, that it seemed like almost there was no time for that. Right, you almost right, right. need a separate person to do the, uh, the the chronicling. Yeah, you, know? you need a scribe. <laughs> you need a scribe. You need someone there to, cr to yeah, log totally. all this stuff. But I didn't I, even realize the value of it at the time. We were just working and many other records I made around those projects with other artists. None of it got to, 
none of it got logged properly you know yeah yeah is... i find I, I find the same thing with you know in my i mentioned last week that i'm in design and yeah you know we're we're often working at a ridiculous pace to try and beat yeah. a deadline and yeah I, you know, it's, it's tribal knowledge. Thankfully, I remember some of the stuff I did 10 years ago, but yeah, often it's like, I don't know what I did. I, I combined these two things and it worked and we, exactly. Mike. And we moved and it's on. A, so a, the tribal knowledge that resonates because obviously we learn how to do stuff that we can apply 10 years down the line on something else and right. that sticks, but actually what we did some sound, you know, if we went through the whole multi tracks of dial, some sounds I would remember, you know, yeah, what yeah. Would it maybe right but, you know yeah no it's hard enough. Cool. yeah it's that's so i no, i saw I, I was really there i don't Love remember it. anything about it <laughs> Love. <laughs> tribal knowledge that's can, a I, can i just drop in on mike's question the the lead sound on but not tonight uh it's like the guitar sound i think it's just a variation of the guitar sound they used on here is the house god it probably you're probably right, Simon. You're probably right because the B side approach was not to was was to do yeah. a B side in a day. So you probably use what's around and just apply it. Is that right? Yeah. I seem to remember reading that they they sampled two, yeah, an upstroke and a downstroke for that guitar part. And oh, I think they interesting. The same thing on, but not tonight. Anyway. Huh. You, All right. you know something, guys. I just want to say yeah, I wasn't I, there. Harris said this, and so did Dave Bascombe. Is that the the fans know more than the guys who actually did it you know is, uh, you, you see, they're telling you what how it was done and you've got no idea <laughs> it's so i love it it's so funny <laughs> there we go cheers simon lloyd you're up next hi hey gareth hey lloyd uh, uh, hi, uh lloyd. yeah um uh, my question is um i read your discography and i noticed you uh worked with anything box on, on the album worth yeah uh I just want to know, what was that session like? What was it like working with um, their main creator, Mosello, uh, if that's his name? Claude. Uh, Claude, yeah. Claude Strilio, I think, is the guy's name from Anything Box. Yeah, he, Claude. That was, I really like that record. I really like the way that, I'm not sure it's the record. I think that record really grew on on us. Uh, I, uh, I don't, that was, a, that was a difficult record to make for some reason because they were they'd come all the way over to Europe to make it I think that might have been made for a major record company there might have been expectations of pop success that didn't necessarily come with the record but to me that's that's a beautiful piece of electro pop it's I love the dark nature of it I love the way it turned out um I'm really proud of it um so worth is, is the album's called isn't it and uh, yeah it's, it's really melancholy and in a way that the melancholy nature that kind of reflects there was a bit of a melancholy atmosphere as we made it in the studio um and uh i don't know claude and i have been in touch on instagram again recently and said how, and we both said how much we'd like to do something perhaps someday together some kind of collaboration perhaps or oh. something uh, uh so so we, after many years, we've re-established contact. We didn't really stay in touch. Um, with, so I think that reflected partly the, the fact that, that the record wasn't quite what anyone was expecting us to make. But in hindsight, like 20 years later, I think it really assumed its place in the canon of Anything Box and is like a, a kind of a milestone, you know. So. Oh, okay. But it was that was I remember it being challenging almost from the get go. I remember it. Being, sometimes you really click with people. And Claude and I, although we were obviously were the, the, the job description was for me to produce a record or produce with him his record. And, and that's what we did. We didn't click immediately. And it's only like later on, almost as we've emerged from that, that we've realized just what a great piece of collaboration it was. Oh, OK. Oh, thank you for answering my question, Gareth. Yeah, cheers, mate. Cheers, Lloyd. Next up is the lovely Atusa. Atusa. Hello. Hi, Vaughn. Hi, Gareth. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, hi, Atusa. <laughs> hi, Larry. <laughs> Your number one fan. 
Hi, Larry. So, so, sorry I'm late, by the way. That's all right. Um, my, my question is about, Gareth, your painting stuff, because I know that you uh, watercolor and you you send postcards of your watercolors available to anyone. I don't see. I'm not sure how pretty they are. Oh, thank um, you. That's so my, that's my one. You. That got. is your one. <laughs> it's your one. You fiend. <laughs> I like yours. Um, so it's <laughs> it's obvious to all of us, even if if some people here are not um, artistic in you know visual arts and stuff, but it's obvious that your music generates really beautiful images. If you Mike was mentioning um, regarding music a couple of weeks ago, that if you close your eyes with some songs, you can see certain things and music creates images and emotions. How much is painting part of your life and does it intertwine with the way that you create music? So does it create paintings or do your paintings create music or do you just like to send postcards? <laughs> I'm curious about <laughs> your watercolor. <laughs> Well, all all three of those things actually. I love sending postcards. My mum used to send postcards, not handmade, not hand painted postcards. She used to send, you know, photographs and postcards wherever she went. I would always get postcards from her. And like many things from your parents, I just thought it was a bit tedious. Uh, many I, before, and I hardly ever sent her any postcards in my twenties and thirties. Later in life, I sent her loads of postcards as well. So I realised that's one of the things I got from my mum. And I do like a postcard. I like the way it gets a bit tattered when it goes through the post and everything can do. Uh, but so, and but for me, there's a big connection in terms of uh, expression. I mixed a record for a, a, a friend um, called called uh, Bates Belk, who's in was in Berlin, uh, and my approach to mixing his record was I played the whole rough mixes. Uh, in my home and I, I did a, a painting uh, for every song um, so some I allowed myself to play each song twice so I had to do like I had about 10 to 15 minutes to do like a quick painting for every song as a way of just entering his world so that was interesting for me and uh, and also I had a breakthrough with collage that I mentioned last week I don't know if you heard me talk about collage last week I had a breakthrough with collage because by creating a collage from, you know, magazine pictures, um, I was able to make a work of art that I was very happy with. And it, uh, having that experience made me start to apply the collage technique to sound. And I did a couple of pieces that are on my SoundCloud that were made from field recordings that I did in the 80s. Um, in in Sri Lanka uh, on an old cassette. I haven't got the cassette machine here. Yeah. But, but anyway, um, so and and they're they're a bit dense those pieces. So I'm going to revisit them and strip them down a bit. But but that was a kind of and then I made these collaged audio pieces before I did the electrogenetic project. And I thought, oh, that's cool. So there was a connection there between the visual art breakthrough and the other thing about watercolors, of course, is I like watercolors because they don't make too much of a mess. At home. We only, I've only got a small flat in London and like having oils like around, I don't really have the space to let them dry. I just like the fact that I can, and I had a big breakthrough with watercolors as an adult about 10 years ago, I suppose, when I had like proper paints and proper paper. So I don't know if you paint, but it's a totally different thing, watercolors on proper paper. Cause when I was a kid, I just used watercolors on cheap paper and it doesn't really work properly it starts uh, wrinkling <laughs> yeah the paper wrinkles and it doesn't you know bloom in the way that watercolors bleed into the so that was just that was just a great breakthrough just i was like wow just putting watercolor on paper blows my mind actually i really love it and i've got little sketchbooks i like to go do sketches on in the country or in the city you know because i like and i'm not i don't think of myself as an accomplished visual artist i'm very proud of the postcards because they're abstract but when i do sketches it's really good because you i have to look at something for half an hour and then just the intenseness of just looking at the scene in this village square or whatever for half an hour whilst i do a quick sketch it changes my perception it's different from taking a photograph i love yeah. photography as well the watercolor if it's not on the right paper then it just smears all over the place yeah 
God, I wish I'd known that. <laughs> I've always been like, why? Watercolors don't look right. It is that's is lame. It's because of the paper. Is that a good answer to your question? <laughs> it's a very yeah. good answer. Thank you so much. I'm going to post a link to the to the postcards in chat if anyone. Thanks, okay. thanks a two. So get your own postcard. Don't steal digital <clears throat> copies of. Mine. I know. <laughs> I ordered mine. Calm down. <laughs> thanks a two. So I I love that question. Cheers to everyone. Love. 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 Oh, yeah. Are we? Uh, do we take turns asking questions? Because I have a, I don't know if it's a question, but yeah, I, I will put you in the queue, Eric. Uh, okay, so cool. I'll go a, on you. We actually have quite a significant queue of questions. So next okay. up is 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 Kia. Hey, Gareth. Thank you so much again, everyone. Um, so my question is: You mentioned the five point one mixes uh, and the remasters. That uh, it's funny to think it's a decade's already gone by. Uh, what would you say is the definitive um, recording uh, for critical listening? I, I know these things don't make that much of a difference sometime, but uh, I'm sure you, uh, you, you have a chance to re-listen to some of those old recordings. And uh, is, there, is the remasters the ones that came out from you, the, the ones that uh, are, the, are the gold uh, benchmark or, or, or the original vinyl? Or I'm, I mean, I'm a big lover. And I, I, I haven't because it's all out of my hands, right? So I haven't like compared the yeah. actual work I did. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the Rima, I'm a big fan of the original vinyl. So yes. when I had this experience, when I started exploring um, uh, experimental electronic music from the fifties and sixties, yes. I, I, I suddenly realized I could go on Discogs. It's not like buying an old Beatles record or a Led Zeppelin record where you got to pay hundreds of pounds. You can buy original Stockhausen for like eight euros. And, and then so buying this, uh, the, fir the the original vinyl pressing that they did, you know, for me, that's what they heard at the time, you know, uh, and I love that in, in, as a fan of other music. So I don't know if it works for the Depeche Mode catalogue, but, but for me, it definitely worked. I try to go back to the original thing because I think the, sometimes the, it, usually the remaster is good when the original as we know, as music lovers, a lot of the early digital masters were shit. Excuse my French. So, so, so then they remastered them in a more musically sensitive way. And that is good. I get that. But but really, it's only because the first digital masters were so crap. So that's why I try to go back for music, anything pre-CD age. I just try to go back to the original vinyl. But I just want to add that when Kevin did the surround sound mixes yes i do think he brought a special extra quality to some of them that i really enjoyed listening to in the studio i think he yeah. en enhanced the bass a little bit on some of the tracks and because because it, it was all surround i mean i haven't got a surround system at home but because it was all surround i was able to listen into the uh the texture where some of the stuff's quite dense you know yeah so but yeah i'm an original vinyl man perfect thank you so much cheers brother all right, Larry, you're up next. Hey, Larry. Hey, th thanks for letting me in to uh, your studio, Gareth. Yeah, you're welcome, brother. We can do Stop. a little. We can do a little tour. Look, <laughs> that's the like some of the modulars, tape machine. I can't even see what's on the Beautiful. camera right now. And then I got that's, that's the the hardware controllers and the speakers, and the lava lamp. Can you see? Can everyone see the lava lamp? Behind yeah, uh, yeah I, I used to have one. Most important. Actually, I'll just. Uh, anyway, I'll just, uh, there we go. So, so like, what, what's like, what's like your favorite piece of equipment to use in like your studio? Like, I'm a fanboy to like f to freak out over vintage vintage equipment. Like, if you showed me like a vintage drum machine from Roland, like the the CompuRhythm CR78, that that's when I start to flip my lid. Like, oh my god. This is uh, this is ancient. This is old stuff. Okay. Well, my thing with vintage stuff, uh, Larry, is that uh, it's it's a bit expensive. So one of the breakthroughs I had with uh, the modern uh, Euro Rack modular that I use, it's not cheap, but it's not vintage price. And when it when it breaks the modern stuff as well, I just had a an issue with one of my make noise modules. I was just able to drop it in the post and send it back to Make Noise in Asheville, and they fixed it for me and sent it back. 
So I get it. With, I don't have the only vintage thing I have in here is this tape recorder. I've got a couple of tape recorders because you can't buy modern tape recorders. Can you see the Revox here? I've got yeah. the Revox, and this is the Stellavox that we used for um, pipeline sampling. Oh, sorry, I think I just. I don't know. Can I, I don't know if anyone can see anything. Vaughan's being wild and free with the camera here. He's gone off. Uh, Beast. Can, can I just say, guys, that is the actual tape machine that was used for recording pipeline. Yeah. The samples. Yeah. The samples. That is so, awesome. Sweet. So beautiful. That That's is a beautiful cool. thing. That's cool. That's really cool. Band boy wow. alert. So I suppose I, for, for Larry, there is a bit of vintage stuff. But there's no stickers all over it. Otherwise, I'm like on modern stuff. For those reasons I said, I just can't afford the vintage stuff. I know that our friends, you know, um, Martin Gore and, and Vince Clark and these guys, they've got wonderful collections of vintage stuff, but, you know, they and, and they can afford to, to store them and use them and maintain them. But for me, it was that was always a bit too much. Um, so, in fact, yeah, so so that's where the, mo uh, the modern Euro rack modular has really broken through boundaries for me. Okay, so like, Va Vaughn, I'm just curious, like what exactly, like what do you coach? Because, um, because because you know that that's one thing that 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 that's been stuck on my mind ever since. Well, Larry, I say this is this is Gar this is we want to get as much answers in about Gareth's thing. So as I said, mate. You get in touch with me at info.vorti.com and I'll be happy to chat to you. Yeah, I know that's that's one thing I'm working on because 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 uh, I'm I'm gonna let I'm gonna let this all be focused on Gareth, but uh, you know yeah. you know just I just I just want like t tell more about my futuristic plans, but okay, but I'll, I'll let it all be on Gareth. Yeah, yeah, yeah Larry, okay. Larry, go ahead and contact Vaughn bon George about that, and and he'll definitely yeah. talk to you about that. So I, sure. I'm sure no. he's a great coach and a good mentor for you to look up to. So definitely take him up on his offer. Von George is a very talented musician, so. Thank you, Rob. I'll yeah, send you yeah, that I, I, I've, heard, I've heard his stuff. I've, I've heard his like acoustic version of Blue Savannah. It's great, well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, exactly, Tom, yeah. we have Tom, who is actually in the front row dead center at the Rose Bowl. You can see him in 101. The movie, uh, the Depeche Mode from, from the Rose Bowl. Um, so, oh, Tom, yes. go ahead. Tom. Uh, hello again, guys. Nice to see you this week. Um, Hi, Tom. Gareth, my question to you is uh, to go back to uh, kind of two-part with uh, Frank Toby. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, knowing what type of person he was, but more specifically that uh, the sample of the uh, printing press is just rhythmic genius and just... Uh, if you have any stories to go along with that, uh, I'd greatly appreciate it. Well, I don't, I don't know what, uh, uh, yeah, Frank, uh, were, uh, Frank was very, Frank probably, I, I mean, back, Frank, like, like I think if I was a kid now, I would have, I don't know, Frank, there's a, probably a diagnosis for what Frank was um, like I think, for instance, if I was a kid now, I think I'd probably be uh, be diagnosed as ADHD. But uh, but when I was a kid, it wasn't like that. I was just like very hyperactive, and, and my mum said, "You always pick up one thing, and then you pick up another thing, and then you do another thing." You know, it wasn't. And so maybe Frank was somewhere on a beautiful artistic spectrum. Um, he was. Uh, I I and as so. He seemed a bit like a spirit, embodied spirit. I suppose we're all in, some people believe we're all embodied spirits. He seemed like a bit like a magical being who tur like turned up, you know. It was a very interesting, making Fad Gadget was interesting because uh, they just had a baby, him and Barbara just had a baby. And so they came to Berlin with the baby in the studio. I think it was the first, obviously in the many years in between, I've worked with a lot of families and artists with kids and I'm very used to kids around the studio. For me, this was a total shock when, when um, you know, ba Barbara would come into the control room sometimes and say, Frank, it's time for you to look after Morgan. And then Frank would just put the baby in Frank's arms and then Barbara would go and do whatever she needed to do. That was like a tough, I was just like, you can't do that, can you? And then I thought, actually, hey, this is a family. You, know, you can do this, it's super important. And then it's something I've embraced now, actually, I love, but, but at the time it was a real shock. The printing press, 
I think Frank found it. I think he was, I think it was between his, on his walk from his lodgings to the studio. I think he just walked past this yard, you know, where there was a printing press. And, and he said, uh, he said, we've got to go and sample that printing press. You know, obviously he knew about sampling by then. And, and um, I think it's before we did strip though. I'm not sure about the chronology, but, but somehow he had this idea and that would have been the same tape recorder, the Stellavox that, that we took down there to, um, because very high quality portable analog tape recorder that we took down to to uh, record the printing press. But for, but beyond that, we also made a big drum loop in the studio for that piece because that's uh, a collapsing new people, the printing press rhythm, isn't it? Yes. And uh, we did so. The, we put the I, ma I made a sixteen track tape loop um, somehow, and I'd never done that before. I made so um but so because we recorded drums and bass and the printing press, I think, on a tape loop, and then looped it up and played it onto another tape machine so we could do the vocal overdubs so 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 the basic rhythm is is the the printing press layered with a drum kit and a bass where where everything's looping the printing press was probably looped from a sampler and then the drums and bass were looped on, on tape uh, so it's it's probably like a very long-winded way of doing something simple. I think I was a bit overcomplicated when I was younger. <laughs> I try and find the simple solution now. I've turned into a Zen master. <laughs> but when I, but when I was a kid, you know, I was like, oh, the more complicated, the better. Yeah. But anyway, it was a lot of fun because the tape loops are really good fun. You see tape loops like going around around the studio. You have like a you know, a few yards long, a big piece of tape just moving around. It's old school. It's a fun thing. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say, love the new project and I'm representing my favorite track off the album, a little Michigan right here for you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. So, so our next question comes from one of the, the people that had one of the greatest reactions when I posted this in the Depeche Mode Global fan group. So Elgren Beto Cruces, you're up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Garrett Jones. I'm, I'm a Mexican. I am not so good to my English, but it's a honor. It's a pleasure for me to meet you. Um, I'm very excited. I just a little I know about your career. I'm, I'm emotional about your new record because I lost my mom last year. It's a great thing about you started a new record and new things to do. It's not you need to do more things like this. You have more time, but well, uh, it's not the it's not the question. It's just my fan uh, action. Uh, well, it's great to meet you too. Thanks, and your English is really good, brother. It's a lot better than my Spanish, which is really <laughs> bad. So I can't say nothing in Spanish. So I appreciate you speaking English. Thank you, and uh, I'm sorry you lost your mom. It happens to all of us. I, at some stage in life, if if we're if, if, if we're lucky enough to live longer than our parents, not all of us do, you know, but, but it's, it's part of life's process, isn't it? So, you know, it's, it, yeah. it's, it's an important, it's uh, I, I had a lot of struggles with my mum actually, I, uh, but in later life, I, I came to realize that she did the very best for me that she could, you know, but when I was a young teenager, whoa, I just had a lot of trouble with my mum. She had a lot of trouble with me. <laughs> He, she do a great job. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, mom. Thanks. Um, I have so many questions. The first, you need to come to Mexico to make uh, something. No, I right. know, like, okay, please come. But well, my Thank you. some some questions I got, but I try to resume. You have a lot of work. Um, I I I I want to think about. The connection with New Baden, it's not my, my speak well, New Baden with the patch mode, because I guess they have something something relation about when you're when you're working with the patch. I, I hear something about connection with that. And the last thing, if you can say, I guess, I suppose you teach to Alan Weiler so many things to, to work with the patch. I, when I start to, to write about the bi biography, I guess, I suppose, I'm, I'm really sure you teach Alan Weiler, or he, he learned about the, the way you work. Is that right? Mm, no, well, I, I think I, 
I learned as I learned a great deal from Alan, and uh, we all learned a lot from each other. Alan and I started working with Depeche. Alan started before me. He was already in the group when I was hired for construction time. He hadn't made an album with them, but he was already in the group. So when I met Depeche, before we even went in the studio together, I met Dave, uh, Fletch, Martin and Alan, and Daniel, of course. So, so he was already there when I rocked up. And he, he was, a, I think he's a great musician and a great uh, studio producer and a great talent. And uh, I, I, I learned a lot from him. We learned a lot together. Uh, it's trying new stuff, you know. He's a uh, he was a, he was a great. Uh, he uh, I've not seen Alan for many years now, and I've not worked with him for a very long time. But a, gr a great musician. I'd love to do something with him in the future. Uh, Neubauten, I don't know. I the the link, the real link between Depeche and Neubauten, I think is Daniel, because Daniel introduced me to Neubauten because they they were part of the Berlin scene. They came down to visit. We had quite a few visits from legendary what as it turned out young Berlin musicians at the time and and they would because Daniel was such an icon with this independent record label he built Mute Records and so they came almost to the court of Daniel Miller and uh, and so, so you know it was like very special I mean Daniel very chilled and everyone was very friendly the people used to come and visit uh, and that's how I met Neubauten and did some work with them I think after don't know when I first started working with them. I know the album was Halber Mensch, but I think that was after we'd done construction time for sure. Um, so there you go. The what other connection there? Yeah, but so I would say Daniel's really the real true connection between Depeche and Neubauten because he okay. knew everyone. Daniel knew everyone. The connection. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, brother. We Thanks. are supporting your record. Thanks and Thank make you. another Thank better. You so much. A lot of things. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. And I have to comment here. We have just tied the all time Depeche Mode global record on Zoom for the amount of people right now. So Woo! hopefully if you're on Facebook, if you want to come join us, let's let's set the new record. So come on and, and join us if you're watching on, on Facebook Live. But um, so I have a question that I'm going to ask on my own, actually, of Gareth here before I get back to the queue. So, so Gareth, that, that recorder that you, you had with Pipeline, that's amazing. Do you have any other kind of souvenirs or, uh, or instrumentation or, or even like memorabilia or anything from your Depeche Mode era that you could mention or talk to us about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's not for sale, Rob. Look at him. He's trying <laughs> to... Have, you know, we, yeah, the I, only thing I've got... You've got I've, this. I've, this is interesting. I've been yeah. lucky to get a few gold discs and platinum discs and stuff in my career. Um, and I, I, I gave them most of them away to the fan clubs, so Erasure and Depeche fan club. I, and the Whoa. fan clubs then auctioned for charity. But I kept one, which is the first one I got. Look, for. I don't know if you can see. Oh, yeah, you can. Look, for everything counts. That's Excellent. the first. That's... A, this is a kind of a, you know, it's a, when you're when you're young, especially, it's a kind of a thing getting a gold disc or a silver disc or something. So, so it was a big. So this is the first one I ever got, anyway, in my whole life, and nice. it's the only one. It's the only one nice. I still got. So that's a bit of memorabilia. But I haven't got any audio memorabilia though anymore. I don't think, because all that old technology, like as I was saying to Larry, a lot of the old technology got too expensive for me to maintain and it was very irritating i had a big a big incarnation in this studio when it was very different uh but but uh, and i had masses of the old equipment and i wouldn't use it for a few months and then i'd come to use it and it wouldn't work and then i'd have like a 500 hundred dollar ma maintenance bill and by that time i'd forgotten the idea you see behind rob uh, rom all the stuff he's he's obviously after it uh, what, 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 what what's your bidding rob <laughs> no this one this no he's he sale. needs to keep that this he needs to a, keep that one also i didn't say so I, i felt it was i felt it was inappropriate disrespectful to the band to sell yeah, them uh, yeah. that's why i donated them to the fan clubs mm. and the fan clubs auctioned them for charity my uh, ones oh, yeah. okay. with both depeche and erasure fan club did that, that oh, i, I felt, wish i would have yeah. heard about those that to yeah. me that felt like respect to the band you know because yeah, yeah. otherwise yeah i'm not trying to you know, yeah, yeah, you know i mean that that's like yeah that's like your birth certificate or something you can't sell it you know <laughs> that's amazing well good job but um i i, I, Rob, I love as that. you say i 
I'm very intrigued by this um, this this tape machine here. Is the Stellavox? Stellavox. Yeah, yeah, that's the actual you know for for pipeline and all those. You still have the sounds on it? No. Oh no, I do have a cassette though. No, sorry, Siri is what Siri thinks I'm talking to. <laughs> wow, that's I do amazing. I do have a cassette because when we went out with this, we we took a backup cassette as well. Um, so I do have an original cassette with us out in the in the yards, uh, you know, the disused railway yards, uh, sampling, and, and there's loads of stuff on there that like, like we're like like just again having a laugh, smashing stuff, banging stuff. Oh, that'd be great. It, it, was that also used for stripped? No, because we made news. Well, this tape recorder. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but strip when 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 stripped, the samples are recorded in the car park. So we ran a long cable out when I when we when we recorded the car engine and the fireworks. We just ran a long cable out into the car park. So that wasn't done with a portable recorder. It was done with, you know, fifty yards of microphone cable going into the wow. console in the studio, <laughs> or whatever. That's very interesting, actually. Let's. The, the the video footage is in that video I mentioned earlier that people can check out on Depeche Mode Global. I linked it. Uh, it's in YouTube, but and it shows the fireworks you guys setting off the fireworks actually. So yeah, that's pretty amazing to hear that you you actually I, had the I'd microphones. Like oh, oh, you'd like to see that? Yeah, send me a link to that, Rob. I'd like to see that. I'd okay, like to sure. See me in the car. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Um, Thanks, brother. And so Nate, are, you're you're up next. Hello. Hi, Vaughn. I am um, Gary. Hi, Nate. Hello. Hi, Nate. Hi, Hello. Nate. You're right. Uh, my question was, uh, um, Gareth, so in your early life, what was your inspiration to become uh, a producer or even like the bands that you went to see? Because I heard earlier in this chat that you said that uh, it synthesizers have already been a part of your life before anyone uh, you produced. So that was basically my question. Well, this, I was I, when I was a kid, I was a... My dad was a big uh, music fan, classical music, right? And they didn't, they were a bit like uh, straight laced, I suppose my f folks, I thought of them as old fashioned and straight laced. Perhaps that's normal with your parents, I don't know. But, but so anyway, they only like classical music. So, and so I was kind of brought up in their uh, environment. So I, that's what I liked. And I still love a lot of classical music, right? But so, and pop music was more or less, they, my my dad thought pop music was rubbish, basically. So I I I remember when I was like twelve or something, fourteen. I thought, no, pop music's rubbish, you know, because that's what my dad said, kind of thing. But so, but gradually, so that but the uh, and the early synthesizer record that turned me on to synths was a a record by a a, a, a person called uh, Walter Carlos, who's now Wendy Carlos, uh, and it's uh, called Switched On Bach. And it's Johann Sebastian Bach, classical pieces from the 17th century, played on the Moog Series 3 synthesizers. Genius editing. Obviously, if you look back, how, you know, so we were talking earlier about deconstructing it. If you imagine it's how they made it, I don't know how they made it. It's a, anyway, but, and that blew my mind. And, and the reason I got into making records was twofold. Because one was because I suppose, I thought I was a bit of a rebel making pop and rock records because because I thought I was rebelling against my dad, you know, and my mom, oh, I'm doing my own thing. But actually, I, I, when I was after about 20 years, I thought, what was one of my dad's favorite things was and I'm listening to records. Duh. So I guess I started making records because my dad liked re listening to records. But more profoundly for me, so many of my musical experiences have been and still are very powerful when I listen to recordings. I'm not like one of these guys. It's not like I, I do go to gigs and I don't, I like I, some gigs I like, right? But really the profound musical experiences in my life have been like on headphones or listening to speakers. So, so in a way I'm trying to echo that experience by helping people make records for, for other people to listen to. Do you see what I mean? That's one of the reasons why Electronic music was such a turn on for me because electronic pop, electro pop, it's kind of constructed in the studio well, like with a computer now or with a tape recorder in the studio. And and to me, that's it's not like um, 
like if you record a rock band, you know, you could say, well, with a rock band, what I'm doing is I'm making a, 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 a documentation of a live performance, like if in a way, because that's the noise they make live. But with an electronic music project, it doesn't exist in any other way other than recorded. And the live versions in many times come afterwards, you know. Yeah. So I was fascinated by that as well. But for me, really, the reason I make records is because I've had so even with any kind of music, classical music, jazz, rock, uh, uh, electro pop, uh, hip hop, all kinds of different music. For me, it's about the speakers. My personal enjoyment is about the speakers or the headphones that I've and, and so so it's really I'm, I'm making what I love and what's changed my life, you know. Yeah, that's brilliant. Though. And I mean, like, I find it really um, awesome as well that like, because that was obviously back in the 70s. And when I talked to my dad about that era, he was saying that, you know, synthesizers and stuff were so new. Like my, some of my dad's favorite bands, obviously like um, Bad Gadget and stuff. And I'm from Leeds as well. So of course, Goth started coming into Leeds. So music started getting a bit dark. And it's quite ironic that I wasn't born in that era, but I'm now in the modern era listening to that while yeah. everything else is going off in a different thing, but that, that's fantastic, Gareth. Thank you. All right, cheers, mate. Na Nate, before you go, I always said to you, you were born in the wrong decade, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, think, yeah, <laughs> I, I sometimes feel I was too. Um, yeah, just, just to elaborate on the question you've asked, Gareth, if you go onto my YouTube channel, um, there is a video I did with Gareth where he speaks very in-depth about how he got into music. He's basically just summarized it now. But if you find that video, he goes into a lot of depth. If you can't find it, send me an email. I'll send you the link. All yeah, right. I'll, I'll Thank find you, that. Thank you. Great question. Cheers, guys. Nice to see you. Over to you, Rob. So uh, <clears throat> just a few minutes ago, we had 63 on here, which is absolutely a new record. We're currently at 62 and we had a request for love. So I'm spreading a little love here because I love oh, that we have so many people joining us today. Okay. 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 And okay. I, as they say in Black Celebration, I'll drink to that. We're just getting some more beer. We're just getting more beers. Can you just cheers, Rob? You do a great job, mate. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mark. Sorry, Let's raise the glass beer. to the other beer. Was, uh, yeah, man, they've been great. Was, I'm drinking uh, rubbish American beer as well. Ooh. Uh, this is this is better. <laughs> so, just to give you an Belgian idea, beer, does it? <laughs> we have quite a bit of a queue, so I'm putting people in as yeah, they're coming go. in. Let's go. So, let's go. Uh, just letting you know. Oh, here we go. You guys got your drinks again? Yeah. All right, Here we go. I'll drink to that. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Love. Cheers. <clears throat> Get a bottle opener. I'm feeling brave with my question when it comes up, Rob. Now, so you don't have to say it for me. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, sure. Uh, I'll, I I have you in the queue, but there's quite yeah, no, a bit. Later, quite a bit later. of right here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so our yeah. next question is coming from Poppy in LA. Hi, Gareth. Thank you so much for joining hey, us. Poppy. Um, hi, Poppy. What, hi. What stands out in your memory as the craziest or strangest thing you've ever sampled? Uh, I've done, well, I've done so much um, because uh, it was such a, a window into a whole new world when when sampling was invented, I suppose. Uh, so the, 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 the fact that we could make beats and melodies out of, you know, anything was so transformative so transformative and so inspirational for me and so many of my friends and colleagues that the whole idea was to find weird shit to 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 make beats and melodies out of there is one uh, i can't remember Fletcher's what track it is spray. no no i said that already ah. there's one track where the loudest sound there's one depeche track where the loudest sound on the track is a match being struck uh, and I can't remember what it is. I'm sure that someone in the community will know. Come on, fanboys and girls. But, I think it will lead up to more than a party. But when when we when we made this when we made this, <laughs> when we made this uh, track, I, I was really fascinated by that because I mean this is not so much about sampling; it's more about the recording process itself. The fact that the, the actually in the real world, that's the quietest sound on the track, the match being. <laughs> But in the recorded world, it was the loudest sound on the track. And I was always very interested in that, the way that it, with the multi-track recording uh, worlds, you know, uh, that we can manipulate dynamic or, or, or like that. We can make false dynamics. 
so so that so that you can whisper a vocal and have it over an incredibly loud drum beat, but you can still hear the whispered vocal. This this inversion of yeah, dynamic, yeah, yeah. I thought, was always super yeah. interesting. Sampling wise, you know, we we got quite. There's some wonderful um, arrhythmic samples on uh, Black Celebration, like a like a saucepan lid falling down the stairs or something. Yeah. Something like something something like this is incredible because it brings a new rhythm to the piece because it's so odd. It's some kind of Euclidean rhythm. I don't know how you describe it. You know, when it goes like that, that kind. Of, so those are those are amazing, innovative. Uh, insights you know that you get out of sampling samplings are incredible I'm, I'm i'm just still in love with sampling and i'm still trying to that my enthusiasm for it is about recreating making new things you know i'm not that interested in you know making a making a, a, a string orchestra in a sampler i know there are some wonderful string orchestras and i know a lot of composers and musicians love using them you're in an incredible room, but that's Hansa. You're in Hansa studio. Yes. I got it. <laughs> that took me a while. <laughs> I hope it brings that good memory. Yeah, it does, it's not yeah. PTSD it inducing. It didn't look like that when I worked in it. It's, this is the refurbished version. Uh, this looks really grand. When we worked in it, it was really uh, scummy. And um, it was awesome audio technology, but it was kind of scummy and like rock and roll kind of vibe. <laughs> Not really impressive and really nice, but now the refurbishment is super grand. That took me ages to get that. I kept thinking, <laughs> she's in an awesome looking studio. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Thank you so much, Gareth. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. So, Thanks so Gareth, thing. along along those lines, um, did the band clue you in? Like at the end of Blasphemous Rumors, it sounds like they're trying to represent blowing out 16 candles, you know, because of the lyrics in the song earlier. And if you count the number, it, it, even though it doesn't necessarily sound like a blowing, it almost sounds like like someone's like sniffing something or whatever. But um, sniffing it, something. Did they clue we you in on that? We weren't sniffing end? anything in those days. <laughs> well, the sound at the end where it's like. <sighs> no, that's no, 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 Rob. That is a, a sound when you're crying. You know, when you go. <sighs> you know, when you cry and you <sighs> and you like and you breathe in like that. You know, when you're sobbing, you go. <sighs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that, is that is that what that's meant to re represent yeah, a sobbing? Because I I always yeah. thought, interpreted it as blowing out sixteen candles. So no, that's no, a good no. nice interpretation, Rob. The thing about that uh, when you make art, isn't it, is that it, it seems its own life. Yeah, and then people bring their own interpretation to the table, which is beautiful. A lot of authors say this, don't they? They write that you write the book. Once you put it into the world, it's no longer yours. And I I really like that. It's so much so. There's some brilliant stories out there about people their whole life misunderstanding the lyrics of a song and then misunderstanding i mean bringing their own idea of what the lyric was especially in pre pre-internet days now you can find the lyrics in a moment obviously but you know i don't know if anyone remembers the world before google but there was a time <laughs> when it was harder to find the lyrics of songs and stuff you know right, anyway right. So I, no, I have no idea about the end of that uh, blasphemous rumors. So I have to go back and listen to it. Yeah, that, so that's interesting. If it is the sobbing, yeah. But either way, there's 16 count at the end of whatever that sound is supposed to represent. But, is there? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, wow, uh, that's deep. Numerology, back on the numerology. Yeah. <laughs> you see, the fans know more than the producers do. <laughs> so we're going to bring back Atusa. She's representing some other questions as well. So... Um, to try to help get some additional questions in here from other people that couldn't join us. Uh, Tusa, oh, thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay, this question is from Yuri, who's a huge fan, and it's kind of a three-part question. Oh, um, since Construction Time Again was the first album that drastically shifted Depeche Mode sound to heavier electronics, and was the first album where Alan was directly involved with production, how was the actual recording organized and who influenced the outcome of the record the most? Also, since you pushed Depeche Mode members to physically go out with a recorder and bang on pipes to record sounds for sampling, how was that idea received by all? Do you think some of the songs like Pipeline, More Than a Party and Landscape is Changing would come out differently without using those recording methods? <sighs> uh so yeah um i think the songwriters are the main influence 
So, I mean, you, I think you can't really work long on with great songwriters without realizing like a, without realizing just how important that is. So, so obviously I could say it was all me, but that wouldn't be true because really it's the songwriters. It's like when, as you uh, get into movies, you realize how important the writers are in the movie as well, you know. Um, has anyone seen Mank, by the way, on Netflix about the writer of Citizen Kane? It's really good. Uh, yes, David, I have. New, I have. new David Fincher movie, it's really good. I highly recommend it. Mank, it's called. Uh, anyway, um, so, so, yes, uh, so, so that's what pushed Construction Time again, is the songs that, the, that Alan and Martin came with. And this, that's such a, it's so easy you know obviously it's like a great story a great it's much easier to make a great film from with a great story and it's much easier to make a great record production with a great song even a even a, a shitty recording of a great song can touch people's hearts in the way that a wonderful recording of a shitty song excuse me i would never say anyone's song was shitty but you know what i mean of a poor yeah. song you can have a wonderful <laughs> recording a million dollar recording and the song's no good that's not going to touch people's hearts unlikely you know so the songs i think started and as for the sampling idea i don't know i i, I think i when we went out to 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 record the samples for pipeline everyone just jumped on that straight away they thought it was a great idea um and i, I was very pleased and excited by my new tape recorder that i bought that that it was cost me a lot of money and it seemed like, great, look, we can go out and we can get some really high quality samples and bring them and put them in the new samples we got. So everyone jumped on that idea. They were very supportive, so much so that, that we went out and uh, recorded everything, right, with, with, on, on the cassette and on this tape recorder. And there's one, there's one button on this tape recorder that, that, that sends power to the microphones. This one, actually, if anyone's interested, this one. And I, we went out and recorded it and and i wasn't very experienced at location recording so i didn't really check it properly and the button was in the wrong position so we got back to the studio and all the recording was distorted and it was, it was shit and so i said I, I was obviously well embarrassed but the guys were so into the process and the idea they said look there's no problem gareth don't beat yourself up we'll just go out again so we went straight back out well it's we did it quite close to here actually it's where I am now in Shoreditch. It's, it's quite close. So this is very close to the garden studio as well, where I am now. Um, but so, so, so that's how supportive they were, you know, and if they, if they thought it was a, a, a cheesy idea, everyone knew this was a very powerful idea. Very, we could just feel it was powerful. It was, it was mad, it's incantatory. It was magical. It was like a rich, a shamanic ritual going out and capturing these sounds from the real world. So, so yeah, they were very. That's it. I think I covered. Did I cover those? I, th I think so. It was a long I question. Think so. Yes, yeah. I, think I know so. there's Thank lots you. of other questions. I I could talk for hours about all this stuff, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time and try and take as many questions as possible. Thanks Good so day. much, Gareth. We love Thank we you. love you for being here. Cheers to that. Cheers, Cheers guys. Cheers. Love. I'll drink to that. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Stop it. Vaughn, <laughs> you're going to get banned. I'm, really, yeah, I'm going to get banned from here, guys. <laughs> going to get Loretta, banned from his own next. show. <laughs> Loretta, you're up next. Hi, Loretta. Hi. <laughs> uh, hello, Gareth and Vaughn. Hi, Hi, Loretta. Gareth, you've got this really cool, sexy uh, white Nile Rogers thing going on. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so being an engineer and a producer um, at the time doing those records, you knew you were doing something pretty progressive and you knew that the uh, lyrics were pretty progressive, too. Yeah. Um, one of the songs that like that I couldn't I, I really didn't understand when it first came out was New Dress. But as I'm getting older, like I'm like, wow, that that song just blows my mind sometimes, and it just comes in my head. Was there any particular song that like wasn't really something back then, but now you see it more and day to day, kind of like I don't know, a line in a poem, but you remember one of those songs from back then because it's it's pretty powerful stuff. And you're a great storyteller, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's great, but I'm lucky. Uh, because it's a great story to share as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. a great story. You're doing I'm, a great job. They, they, it's great content, you know. <laughs> but um, the, 
one of the things about this chat that I've done on, with with Rob and what we did with Vaughan la last week is it's making me. What, I mean, I don't really listen to the old work that I did, um, and this is one of the reasons why I've, I've generally. It's only since I've met Rob and Vaughan that I've started talking about Depeche again. I kind of made a decision to stop talking about it because I've said so much. But talking to all you guys has made me seriously think about taking an afternoon out of my life and go back and listen to all those records that, uh, to see now what they, how they, how they sit with me. You know, um, I I remember. I mean, we've we've spoken about Pipeline, or I've spoken about Pipeline a bit already. That that was a, like a, a break conceptually. That was a breakthrough record for me because almost every sound on it is from the, the real the real world. They, they're not really any conventional musical instruments on it, and so that was. I mean, that's easy to do now. But at the time, yes, you're right. We 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 were. I, I was certainly an arrogant young man, um, uh, and I definitely believed I uh, I was helping change the world by doing new stuff. Listen to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so so that was clear. I think we felt we were forging new ground, and that was our intention. And as I mentioned before, and we were very fortunate that we were sponsored, if you like, by a record company who was also very interested in experimenting and breaking new ground. And not every not every artist sponsor is interested in that, as some of you might realize. Sometimes they, they definitely don't want any new ground. Mm. They want the safety of oh, yeah. what you did two years ago. Financial re back yeah. many yeah. Many backers, uh, it's only the most adventurous financial backers who will say, no, go do something new. You know, obviously a lot of that happens around Silicon Valley. But so, so all the sampling, all, all, all the, 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 the song pipeline itself was absolutely magical. But every one of those songs I, I worked on have their own story. There's a, an, another song um, uh, um, where, I'm, where we made it in a very special way, where Alan plays the piano and Martin sings. Somebody. Um, and the way that we, we recorded it on tape, right? And... Uh, I suppose you could say, suppose we recorded the piano in stereo and the, so my, my, suppose we used four tracks to record the vocal and the piano. Now we had 20 tracks say on the tape. So the way, so we recorded one pass of it. There's no click or anything. It was just recorded free, huh. them singing and playing yeah. together. So we recorded one pass and then we recorded another pass without, but to get the best one. You know, yeah, yeah. And it's quite normal. You just record a number of takes and then you pick the one. Oh, that one was beautiful. We'll yeah. use that. One. When we came to mix it, I, I realized that I could mix in the other takes with the take that we had. Yeah. They were completely out of time and stuff happens. And if you listen to it, the weird echoes yeah. are other takes of the performance. Okay. So that, that sticks in my mind very strongly because of the the way we made it the way that it turned out and in fact when kevin came to do the surround sound remixes the 5.1 remixes he he got that he thought it was done with delay lines and yeah. he was completely couldn't work out how to get the right echoes it was sometimes on the vocal it? It must be yeah. sometimes yeah. And yeah. The vo yeah. he couldn't work out how to get the vocal and the piano with the right delays on it and i said no kevin we didn't do it with delays look in the other tracks actually and then he was like oh i got it you know, so, so that was a real, that was as a as a piece of studio work. That's yeah. a real interesting construction for, to me. Yeah. You know, that that that's a great answer. And and Gareth, Thank along you. those lines, it, it's an honor as actually that you're going to go back to this stuff. When you do go back, in particular, some great reward and Black Celebration. To me, the production on there sounds so great that it doesn't sound like you're like if some great reward was recorded in 84 if i hear a, a record from 84 a lot of those synthesizers and things sound very outdated on other artists albums but master and servant could sound like it was released today and it sounds like an amazing production so if you go back and listen to those i'd like to i'd be interested to find out what you think about how well the production end ho holds up in like today's music actually from especially some great reward and black celebration well 
I mean, thanks for your positive vibes, man. But because what happens is you go back and listen, you just pick holes. It's really easy to pick holes in it yeah. for me. Like, that's why one of the reasons you don't go back. I'm going to go back and listen to you and go, oh, no, listen to what I did. Oh, what was I thinking? Why did we do that? Oh, but of course, it's that, that it's gone out into the world. That's uh, that's what that's. So, so, so I don't beat myself up about it. You know, we don't. I love the work, but we have to detach from the work and give it away. You know, I don't know if I, it's almost like I need another 10 years before I'm ready to listen to it. <laughs> I, I feel like you're layering your layering of instrumentation and the samples, that's what really made it sound more timeless than like if, you know, someone's just playing a, san a simple sa sound on a regular synthesizer or whatever. Yeah, we, yeah we, 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 we definitely were, uh, we, we spoke about layering last week, we were definitely trying to make new, new sonic worlds. Yeah. That's the experimental electro pop part of it. Yes, we, were, we had great pop songs, but production wise, and so we were trying to investigate what for us was a new sonic landscape forging our way into a new landscape you know so awesome. anyway yeah I, I, i'll pluck up my courage and listen to some of the old records <laughs> well as you know we all love it so yeah thank you thank you brother and i and for those of you who didn't catch that i just mentioned that word again but <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna have to be careful with this love word <laughs> eric, <laughs> eric, <laughs> eric you're, you're gonna up send next. us on a downward spiral i'm i'm up Yes, Eric. All right. Yeah, I had a bunch of questions, but and I've been fumbling around with different ones. But um, I guess specific to Depeche Mode, I know you worked with Erasure and, and knew about and all that. But specifically with Depeche Mode, is there one particular song where you feel like you got it all together and you just nailed it, both like from a technological standpoint, where you just you did some groundbreaking things with with like the synthesizers and the sounds and then and, and utilizing stereo back in the day. Cause I know with, with um, everything counts, you got the, the thing going left and right at the very beginning. Yeah. That's my um, one brother. That's my what, one. Everything that is counts. It? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like, I just feel like that's, that's the one. Right. But, and then, and then contrary to that, where's what it? That's why I got this. This is, uh, I know I love it. That's, that's, in a way, in a way, it's it's. I know what Rob means about yes, the production gets more sophisticated on some great reward and black celebration, and it's awesome and it gets denser and darker. But in some ways, I love uh, construction time again because it's my I first love, outing yeah. with the boys. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not even producing. I'm. I mean, I'm. Whatever. I don't have a production credit. I just engineered it. I love the sound of construction time again. And and of course I'm going to say everything count everything counts an easy one because it's the first single that I ever made with the band, so that's and a special. It's like a first kiss, right? It's a special it's thing. It's timeless. It's timeless. It's timeless really. Yeah. And, and you know what? Everything does count. It does in large in amounts. Large amounts. Well, <laughs> so I was going to say that. Case, is there a case where you feel like you and pick any band if you want? Doesn't have to be Depeche Mode. Where you feel like you nailed it. Right, you got it, and you're like, "This is going to be a hit. It's going to be huge. I know it. It's recorded. We saved it. It's going out, and it's but for whatever reason, because I know REM has a song just like that where they feel like they nailed it, and it and it never got the rave reviews or the success that it is. Is there a particular song that you feel like you nailed it, but for some reason it just didn't it didn't take with with the general population I, I i i don't know uh that, that's a hard question i'm not i'm not a professional commercial producer in the sense that i'm aiming at getting stuff in the charts when i was working with depeche i was very keen that everyone should be happy and i was very keen to maximize help maximize the emotional delivery of the songs and this kind of thing but it wasn't like there was never an atmosphere in the studio though yeah. certainly i i never felt i was aiming at, ch at getting in the top 10 or anything maybe the songwriters was or the record company i was just trying to help make awesome music and that's still yeah. what i do now maybe that's why i've not had a lot more hits so you did. maybe if i had focused on the top 10 i'd had a lot more hits in my life but my relationship to music you see i was never i was i'm a huge music lover i was never necessarily a lover of the 
charts. Yes. Uh, yeah. In a way that some great pop musicians are lovers of the charts. I know some of my dear friends, very skilled artists, they loved many things in the chart. Really, the charts wasn't much to do with it for me. I mean, I get it. If you're in the charts, you get more funding to make the next record. Sure. I, I get it. True to the music. So and it, show, it shows that you've reached a lot of people as well, brother, which is important. Right. Um, what you're saying. Actually, if it touches a lot of people's souls, that's wonderful. I, I, I get. But I find I, songs from The Cure all the time and they're rare, obscure things. And I'm like, gosh, this is a beautiful song right here. Yes, there you go. No airplay. But my one last question, real quick. I've all these instruments and things you've got. I know you had the tape recorder thing, the tape, reel to reel, all that stuff. You've got probably 808 machines, stuff from Roland. What one is your just your favorite go-to, like just the way the sound comes out of it, the way you can create so many different types of music with? What, what instrument tool is your, is your personal favorite? Well, I don't have, a, uh, I, you might have missed it earlier. I said, I don't have any vintage stuff, any vintage instruments because they're, they're too expensive and, and, to maintain and, and too expensive to buy. I. You, I mean, and, and I find the, the, the modular rig that I've got, this is part of it, the rest at home. I find that the make noise modular is a very creative playground for me. That's all I can, and one it of the is. things that, it surprises me constantly. And this is supposed I, to be echoed in the name of my project, electro From a layman, I don't even know what the modular means. What does the modular do exactly? Is that like, it, it's a it's a very uh, it's a very fertile playground um, uh, where you build a separate synthesizer, if you like, for every no, musical thing you want to do. So you can so, create any kind of sound. Well, I don't know about any gun. Yeah, it makes a lot of different sounds. But but the power of it for me, and I'm trying to express this in the name of my project, Electrogenetic, is that the electronics themselves give birth to rhythm and melody and musical ideas uh, in, in interaction with the performer or the programmer. So So my, and this is, and discovering the power and the random beauty and the eccentric surprises that the my modular synths can give me and many modular synths give the people who work with them has allowed me to create finished pieces from spiritual friendship and nous alpha that i do with chris and the, some of the work i've done with daniel and the work i've done as a solo artist electrogenetic it's all inspired by building patches on this crazy beast of a of a weird no it looks it looks it doesn't make any sound till you plug wires in it's something to, do to explore anyway it's a thing it's a big thing it's all over the internet modular synthesis is a joy for me cool i will check that out all right yes thank please you do very much Cheers. appreciate the time no, god bless thank you <laughs> look at simon <laughs> simon can you get that keyboard out of your background it's freaking me out man <laughs> get rid of that keyboard thing in the background <laughs> I don't oh, like that keyboard. I don't. What's that? That's a keyboard in the background. Yeah. I don't. Ah. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, no, uh, oh, anyway, yeah. let's take another question. Ross. So, so Thank sure. I, before we get to that, I just want to make sure. Are you okay? We keep going. We're kind of at two hours, and we have a long queue of questions still. But it's up to you. You know. I'll, I, I'll, thank you I'll take some time. more questions for sure. And okay. and I know we said two hours, but I'll take more questions. And I just ask for empathy and sympathy if i get burnt out i'll holler oh for sure absolutely and we we really appreciate you doing this and uh to to reiterate with eric's question i know that one of the things that they that you said one of your hesitations for working with depeche mode was that they were a band that was actually on the radio yeah so, exactly pop band yeah it's not really and, my thing and and part of the reason we're all here i mean i have been a fan for 35 years and a lot of these people have been fans for for many decades a lot of the reason we are here is because we don't like that chart music. We don't care about that pop music that's in the charts. This is what connects to our souls as, as we were talking about earlier. So uh, thank you again for your work and, and, and yeah, I get that Rob. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm a fan too, you know, and, uh, and I do think that they've done a wonderful, and it is, it's, it's like, uh, you know, just because some in, in music, I, I struggled with this. I don't struggle with it anymore, but I struggled with it 
in my thirties, I suppose. And I, then I realized just because something's in the top of the charts doesn't mean it's good. But as we all know, there can be stuff that we really think is really, really good. That is popular too. And that's wonderful, you know, but just cause it's popular doesn't mean it's good. It's true. That's right. True. And, and, you know, along those lines too, I, one, one of the things that was interesting you know, as Depeche Mode fans, we don't n- normally care. Like, it's cool they haven't won a Grammy, whatever. We don't care. But it was kind of good validation that they made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for a lot of us fans. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you feel about th- the band that you worked with albums making it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Does that have any kind of impact in the UK or is it just kind of like a weird whatever that America? No, it, did. It, it doesn't. I, I don't think music fans in the UK know about it. It didn't have any impact on me because I knew because 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 it's about the, I, the art is I mean I you know I, I have no problem calling this stuff art it's pop art right so the art is valid whether they're in the rock and roll as we all know whether in whether in the hall of fame or not it's probably quite good for the the catalog maybe you know it might be quite good for the record companies it's a these things it's like the the it's like the, what's it called the Oscars it's a great thing if you can get an Oscar nomination it means more people are going to check your film out yeah true. You know? yeah yeah very true so you know i'm sure it's a great thing but i don't really care cool matt matt smith you're up matt smith ah oh, him again oh, not this not this guy doing? again oh no yeah. Hello, matt. i thought it was documentary evidence matt <laughs> I keep you. sorry Hi, matt. Yeah, uh, i was listening to your album on wednesday this week all sort of all day and i got to um alone together and it was it, for me it's it's the best track and um when it got to bits like lyrically it was saying things like we live we die all for nothing and i, I thought when i got to that point i thought that's quite depressing but then it said um all for everything and, and it just sort of it, it just said to me it's such a, a well-balanced yeah. way of looking at things and um I really enjoyed it and it, you know obviously the sound's brilliant but um but the words were just it lifted it so much more so um i just want to say thanks for that um, well thanks matt I, yeah. I i appreciate i appreciate you listening and i appreciate your kind words obviously um i got you know that this kind of dichotomy of importance i got from my therapist told me a wonderful story about I don't know where it might be a, a, a some some a, 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 a spiritual tradition where people carry around. They have two pockets uh, in the left pocket and the right pocket. They have two messages, uh, and you take one message out, and it says, "You know, I am the center of the universe. I am the most important thing in the whole universe." And then in the other pocket, you have got a message that says, "I am an insignificant speck of dust," That's right. and. F- and as I've got older, I, I, I'm much more flexible with the both and uh, relationship. So both of those are true for me. They're both true at the same time. I used to be more of a, like an either or guy. Like, oh, it's either got to be one or the other. And as I've got older, I've, I've got a less dissect. I don't dissect stuff so much. I synthesize stuff together. So, uh, uh, you know, that's that. And that's echoed slightly in that in that piece uh, alone together because i'm trying to say both things both things it's totally meaningless but it's the most important thing in my life yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. i think it's something that comes with age isn't it i mean it's for me anyway and you've just sort of said that um yeah it's it's i'm definitely less i'm, I'm definitely more inclusive as i've got older i realize this this both and both that both and is is a great way of looking yeah. at things you know sure. but my main question i won't keep yeah. everyone okay was um hypothetically if you were on a desert island yeah what i know it's a bit of an unrealistic question but what single album would you have with you and also w- what piece of kit providing you had headphones <laughs> and power and power right power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. what what one single album that's a hard question I, I know. but actually to be honest i you know i would instruction time <laughs> no 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 I, I would be it would be something like uh 
uh, uh, you know, um, I don't know, Bach, one, late Beethoven quartets or yeah. something really deep written by someone, a great master in their, in their prime elderly years, you know, or late, something chamber music, you know, I don't know, it's a bit, it sounds like a, a cliche, but as I've, I've always loved Beethoven my whole life. And as I've got older, I've understood, I've entered into a deeper relationship with the later works in a, in a really emotional way. So it'd probably be some great piece of icon, uh, some iconic piece from the classical heritage, you know, actually. As for, as for, uh, you know, piece of kit, it ha I mean, does, does my modular count as one piece of kit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to take my modular case. I'd have to have a bit of a think. If I was allowed one case, I'd have to, there's one case there that I could just pick up and be happy with. But uh, I've also just got recently, there's a Pittsburgh modular I've made something called the Voltage Control Labs thing. They did it on a, on a, not an Indiegogo, something like that. One of those things where you sponsor hardware. What's it called? Was it, was it uh, Kickstarter? Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, they did yeah, a Kickstarter yeah, yeah. and it sold out really quick. And I bought one on eBay just recently. I could only find one in the world that was for sale. Wow. And that's an awesome little synth. I've just got it at home at the moment. Really? So, but really, yeah, my make noise modular would be my, my one piece of kit. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Matt. Cheers, matey.